Good morning. Uh, wonderful to see so many faces. Um, we're excited and thrilled to welcome you to Navon. Navon is Maharat's think tank and an opportunity to showcase um, deep thinking and ideas that we want to bring into the community. It's an opportunity to imagine and and um, and then write. Um, and today we are featuring um, the plague the plague project, which is a a book that is is edited and compiled by our very own Rabbi Dr. Aaron Lee Smokler. Um, a collaborative project with many with many people and featuring the work and and thoughts of of many of our presenters that you'll you'll learn from today um, and want to in particular thank all all of all of our speakers that we'll learn from throughout the day as well as the sponsoring institutions that have um, supported this this day and this project just a, a brief moment of orientation um when uh, you know it seems like so long ago but it was not that long ago when we started hearing and learning about the current plague um about covid-19 um there was a a a tendency to to wonder what we've learned already about the plague and so, so about corona about covid and so um, the data we had was what we knew from other countries and 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 the ways in which it was impacting the world already by the time it came to the US. But there was other data that we had and that was historical data and I became obsessed personally, some of you know this already, of listening and learning about the uh, the uh, um, Spanish flu, which is maybe a misnomer um, of 1918 and the ways in which it impacted and um, and the ways in which we we what was happening to us were similar and dissimilar. Uh, and I think that we always have a lot to learn from the past. And in order to understand the present and the future, we have to have a lens of, of what was. And I think that that's the brilliance of, of this project and this idea is taking a, a uh, something that is so um, part of our, our liturgy and our scholarship and our tradition, the idea of, of um, the plague, of um, how biblical plagues impacted the Jewish people, and trying to understand what we can learn and understand about our present and our future. Um, and I think that, that, that throughout the day, we're, we're going to have the opportunity to both reflect on the past um, think about today and and um, more importantly, try to together come up with a theory and a philosophy of what this means for our future. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Aaron Lee Smokler and um, our panelists. Um, I also want to thank some specific people, Rabbi Jeff Fox, who, who uh, put a lot of time and energy into Navon in general and uh, um, pulling together this conference, um, to Jen Vegg, who is our um, Director of Community Engagement and did a lot of the, the marketing. Um, and. Uh, and you know all of the Maharat team in the back who who are are, are part of of bringing us together today, um, and very special um, thank you and much gratitude to to you, Aaron, to Rabbi Aaron Lee Smokler. Great, hi everybody, <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome. It's really an honor to uh, be here today with all of you. Um, at this conference, which is a real collaboration between diverse Jewish organizations and, <clears throat> excuse me, and a celebration of a book that is itself a collaboration um, of colleagues across disciplines, all wrestling with Torah in a time of plague. <clears throat> so COVID-19 has wrought so much challenge and so much change in our society. And we are privileged to be here still today to grapple with the meaning of it all, the impact of it all, the pain of it all, and maybe even the promise. <clears throat> today, we will be reflecting on plagues present and past. We will learn about Jewish responses to crisis through lenses that are cultural, theological, historical, and architectural. 
We'll hear from rabbinic visionaries who in the trenches with their congregations and constituents are etching a path forward, philosophers who are wrestling with the theological implications of pandemic, artists who are using their art to carry us through, <clears throat> theorists and practitioners who are literally changing the face of our built environment. So we begin with this morning's panel entitled Cultural Responses to COVID-19, The Plagues Project. And joining me are three incredible culture makers who in their own right and collaboratively have begun to offer ways for us to collectively process and learn from our year of uncertainty. They have been my partners in crime in the creation of one output of the ep epidemic, this web-based platform called The Plagues Project, which you will hear much about. To start us off, we'll introduce ourselves briefly and share a word about what brought us into this work. First, Zoe Furtick, then Shira Hecht Kohler, and then Dan Liebeson. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Erin, and thank you to my co-collaborators. Um, I uh, came to the Plagues Project wearing two organizational hats that I'd like to introduce today. I come representing both the Oshman family JCC in Palo Alto, as well as Bina, the Jewish Movement for Social Change, which is in Israel. And both of these organizations came together to create the Plagues Project with my co-collaborators who will introduce themselves shortly uh, for different reasons. And I'll just briefly tell you and then pass the baton. Bina is an organization that cares about pluralistic Jewish learning. And I think you will find out from the, when you see the Plagues Project that this is an incredible example of pluralistic Torah learning. And I think that's part of why Bina wanted to be a part of this project. And the OFJCC here in Palo Alto, California, Silicon, heart of Silicon Valley, cares a lot about innovation for the future of Jewish life. And one of the you know, crazy pivots we had to make at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic was figuring out how to put content online. And the Plagues Project is an incredible example of how we were creative in a time of crisis in putting content online. And that I think is part of why the OFJCC wanted to be part of this project. But mostly I have to say that this project is an outgrowth of a beautiful friendship and beautiful collaboration with my colleagues. So I would like them to introduce themselves now. I'll pass it right to Shira. Hi everyone, thank you Zoe for opening and thank you Aaron for orchestrating for everyone involved. Um, I'm Shira Hecht Kohler here in New York City. I'm the Director of Education for 929 English. You recognize some of your faces, there are some new faces here, so it's just a delight and honor to meet new faces, new friends, and to learn and study together today. Um, I wanted to just offer a very brief window into how the Plagues Project fits into the larger mission and matrix, really, of the 929 <clears throat> Project. Some of you know about 929. For those who don't, very briefly, 929 is the number of chapters in Tanakh in the Hebrew Bible, the formative text of Jewish heritage, but it's also the name of a cutting-edge project, a global project, an Israeli project, an American project, North American project, and creating a conversation around Tanakh. And 929 as a platform invites Jews, um, and really people of, of all faiths everywhere, to read and study Tanakh one day, uh, one chapter a day, one parak a day, Sunday through Thursday, together with a website with creative readings, reflections, pluralistic interpretations, audio, video by a very wide range of artists and writers, scholars, educators, rabbis, students, young students, um, and more. The daily cycle takes three and a half years. We are up to uh, Mishle Parag Zion, it's the 724th chapter. So for those of you that are learning along, call it Kavod. Um, my colleague, very close colleague, Rabbi Adam Mintz, also uh, faculty and Talmud teacher at Yeshivat Maharat. Um, it was the co-conspirator <laughs> creator together with me of, of the English language platform. Um, Rabbi Mintz, unfortunately, can't be here today. He was supposed to be moderating some of the panels. He lost his father. Um, so we offer comfort and condolence and learning in memory of um, Professor Benjamin Mintz. 
So one major goal, and here's how we sort of, sort of connect to the Plagues Project, a major goal of the 929 Project is to give everyone an entry point into the text. So on a cycle basis, and I'm going to share my screen here just for a second so that you see a particular page of 929. It happens to be Barchinafshi, a very beautiful Perak, Tehillim, Kufdal at 104, just so that we can get a visual sense of all the different elements that go into the project. And the major goal is after reading a Perak in Tanakh is to ask the question to any reader, to any learner, to any writer, what grabs you? What draws you in? What's your point of entry, both where you are now and where you have been, where you hope to go, or your aspirations and your dreams? How do you, as a human being, look at this text, connect to the text? How do you, as a Jew, look to this text and connect to this text? We have many students and leaders from Yeshiva Maharat who have written. We have over 700 writers and contributors on this site and about uh, 9,000 pieces of content um, uh, so far. Um, and the question is really, as Zoe said, what lens do you wear when you look at a particular text and what voice can you add? So this is the same approach that we took when we collaborated on the Plagues Project. While it's not an exploration of a particular text, it's not a particular parak in Tanakh, it's not one chapter, it's much more thematic, but it is the same approach. What is your point of entry at this moment past moments, future moments, what anchors you, and how can you situate yourself? I mean, it's both been a way, the Plagues Project has been a way of engaging and anchoring with this moment, but also other moments, text, history, and, and community. So that's really what we tried to do in this collaborative model. And um, I'm going to pass to Dan to introduce a bit more on his end, and then we'll go into, we'll go into depth on the project in just a moment. But thank you everyone for everything today. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Levinson. I'm the founder and uh, director of, a, of an organization that we're, we're doing some rebranding now, but we're putting it all under the, the title of Judaism Unbound, which some people know as a, as a podcast, but it's also, we mean it as more of a movement. I don't mean a denomination. I mean a movement of people to accomplish something uh, in Judaism. And, and I've been thinking a bit, little bit about what, how to define that. I, my 15-year-old daughter just got her learner's permit, so I've been lecturing her on all kinds of driving tips. And uh, one of them, you know, as we all know, although I think a lot of us don't know what this really means, is to steer into the skid, uh, meaning don't fight. Don't fight the, the, the changes that are going on in our society, but actually uh, understand how maybe I can uh, gain some control over them by accepting them and then building on them. So Judaism Unbound and all that we've been doing is uh, what we think of as uh, about harnessing the energy of, of just regular Jews for bold innovation in Jewish life. And so we, we really are focused on what we call the unsatisfied, the uh, disconnected and the potential, meaning the, the, the Jews that are organizationally affiliated but not particularly happy about their organization, now that might be all of us, uh, the the uh, disconnected, which are the people that the Pew study, for example, finds outside of Jewish institutions, but they say being Jewish is really important to them. Uh, they're proud to be Jewish. They really want it to mean something, but it hasn't. Uh, and and then we, we call the potential, which are people that aren't currently Jewish, but are uh, really interested in it. And there are a lot of those as well. And I think a lot of Jewish organizations think of it as a kind of a marketing challenge. How can we, how can we get those folks to uh, sort of, um, you know, participate in what we're already doing. We see it as an innovation challenge. Uh, how can we build something new uh, based on the old stuff that uh, that will really connect with them uh, deeply where, where they are? And that's, uh, I would also say, I think that's the tradition. So that's the that's the set of uh, sort of mission orientation of us. And, and we've been using the, the digital revolution a lot, especially during this year of COVID, but, um, but even before that, to understand that the digital revolution, like the printing press before it, enables all kinds of new possibilities. And that's where we'll get to, I think, in describing this project. OK, great. Thank you. So I'll share that what brought me um, to the Plagues Project uh, was the book that has accompanied my journey through the pandemic, the collection of essays and, frankly, collection of soul friends who, who comprise Exumni Torah in a time of plague a book that we are celebrating today. So I am merely its editor, um, but I am also its instigator and its beneficiary. As the months of quarantine began to accumulate, I wondered what the Torah of the moment was to be. 
I ask colleagues, people who I admire, to share their thoughts with me, be they academic, personal, homiletic, or somewhere in between. And what followed was an outpouring of reflections on these vertiginous times and of various attempts at finding balance. Some of us sought stability through history or ritual, through a Jewish tradition that reminds us time and again that our unprecedented times have much precedent. From the 10 plagues of the Bible through the bubonic plagues of the Middle Ages, Talmudic Magefa misfortunes to shtetl outbreaks and beyond, the Jewish people alongside of humanity has suffered through a great deal of disruptive adversity. Torah in a time of plague brings together academic and rabbinic voices from within the COVID-19 plague to wrestle in real time with its echoes and its implications. So a word about its contents. <clears throat> Um, so here you see section one of the book is Theology of Plague, some of the, some of the writers you will meet today. Um, it reckons with some of the many theological disturbances that pandemic has wrought, challenges of randomness, of making sense of a loving God in a broken world, human responsibility versus divine culpability in the face of disaster. These are contemporary reckonings with the age old problem of theodicy. The next section, Jewish community and practice under duress takes up issues related to ritual, law and collective activity that has arisen on account of the social dictates of COVID-19. Quarantine and full lockdowns characterized the early months of the pandemic and continue to determine if we gather, how we gather, where we gather and what religious acts we might perform individually or together. They have certainly prodded us to reevaluate the meaning and the power of gathering. And these essays offer insights into the stresses of aloneness and the yearning for togetherness that has marked this time. Next, history and literature of plague turns to plagues of the past to see how they affected their European Jewish communities. Using liturgy and response literature, we can see how grave illness yielded tremendous physical loss, altered religious life, and also generated creativity. Today, we'll hear from Josh Toplitsky about that. Quarantine Reflections invites some personal meditations on the costs and gifts of COVID-19. From giving birth amidst relentless death to raising and reading with children, celebrating the Shabbat in isolation, to studying Tractate Shabbat with a virtual global community, these essays attest to the complexities of our everyday lives in lockdown. And finally, the last section, Time in Unprecedented Times, explores the ways that time itself has been warped by the plague of our age. Thrust into our homes and out of our routines, COVID-19 has altered how we relate to temporality. Time bends, shrinks, and expands when the schedules that anchored our lives are no longer our signposts. The passage of time in our bodies, aging, has also taken on new meanings as we reckon with the feelings of lost time. The Torah in a time of plague both reflects on and contributes to Torah in our time. As we continue to navigate our way through the multi-layered coronavirus epidemic, I hope that these eclectic, sobering, and stirring reflections might in some small way help us find a way through the vertigo. So in addition to our 20 or so writers in the book, there, were so, there are so many deep souls emerging during this time whose voices need to be heard through different media, addressing different messages, and they needed to be heard sooner than the timeline of book publishing would allow. And so I reached out to Shira, Zoe, and Dan, hoping that they might be able to bring their genius to this endeavor to build a portal to enter the ongoing conversation of our people with creativity, boldness, and big vision, merging the voices of my writers with their thinkers, artists, and activists, the Plagues Project was born. Zoe, I turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Erin. And wow, it's so exciting to see the book in like, it's actually here. So Yasha <laughs> to you, that's awesome. It's so exciting. Um, thank you. So uh, just like Erin said, uh, Shira and Dan and I are a team and we uh, t- teamed up, we expanded our collaboration by teaming up with Erin to create the Plagues Project. And I would love to show you now what the Plagues Project is and to give you a little tour of what we built. Shira and Dan and I have made three projects together. We've made the Akeda Project, the Plagues Project, and the Megillah Project. All of these projects, and they're very easy to find, akedaproject.com, plaguesproject.com, megillaproject.com, all of these projects are a collection of videos that are interpret that present interpretations of famous texts. In this case, the Akeda, the Ten Plagues, or Megillat Esther, from a variety of perspectives. And just like Shira showed with the page she demonstrated from uh, from Nine Two Nine, all three of us really cared about creating a collection of interpretive possibility that was organized by point of entry, organized by method organized by perspective. And we were already doing this type of work. And when Erin found us and we got to talk to Erin and we saw that the book she was creating was also organized in such a fashion, it was an obvious collaboration to be had. So let me show you a little bit what this might look like. I'm gonna share my screen. Give me like a thumbs up nod if you can see it. Awesome. So this is the Plagues Project and it is a collection of videos, which you can see here now as I scroll. There are about 30 videos on this page. And they are, as you can tell, organized by method, discipline, perspective. We have a few videos here with some people you might recognize called Entering the Text, a variety of perspectives. This is text-based interpretation. This is gonna be very familiar to a lot of people who have done text study before. Let's have the text in front of us. Let's see what it says. Let's interpret it using the words on the page. Then we also have something that we're calling wrestling with a story. It's one step back. Okay, we now understand the words on the page. What meaning are we going to make from this story? How are we going to wrestle with the interpretations that arise when once we understand the story itself. And then we go a little bit more farther afield. We have contemporary lenses relating these texts to contemporary circumstances and sort of extrapolating from the text to make meaning through a contemporary lens. We have the view from the academy. This these are academics who are bringing their academic discipline and their academic expertise to bear on these texts. And we get to watch and see, wow, look how different this discipline is in the way that they read these texts and the way that they make meaning from these texts using their academic expertise. We have interpretations throughout history. These are uh, ways of understanding the 10 plagues, you know, without necessarily having the text right in front of you, but how do you understand 10 plagues over history, how have plagues come, how have we seen plagues throughout history in a variety of ways? So we have four amazing videos here that show us plague in a more general way throughout history. Then we have perspectives of art and literature. These are um, a variety of ways of thinking and understanding plagues through art and through writing. We have Chagall, we have Haggadahs, we have Hollywood. So these are a variety of perspectives of understanding plagues through art and literature. And then we have also a compilation of other sort of videos that we've found that deal with plagues in a variety of uh, different media, which is really, really a lot of fun to watch. So you can see here that we've been able to collect a variety of perspectives on the plagues throughout time, not just the biblical plagues, but plague in general. And we have organized it by sort of point of entry perspective, discipline, expertise. So that is a little bit of a tour of this incredible collection that we've compiled. And I wanna give you a sense of the types of videos that we've been able to collect here. So for example, we have something that might look familiar to a lot of you. 
this is my wonderful friend and colleague, Leon Wienerdow. And he, um, in this video, is going to talk about the 10 plagues from the Bible and offer a helpful text, text-based interpretation. And this is familiar to us for the, it's awesome to have it in video form. He's a great speaker. He has like a little studio here. So it's nice and modern and <laughs> easy to watch. Um, but this is familiar to us and I'm sure you will understand what I mean when you hear him. So now I return to the question of Egypt and ask why was Shekhin? Why were boils one of the plagues? And I wanna suggest that perhaps what's going on is that there's a societal question, who's in and who's out? And here I wonder who's, who's on the inside and who's on the outside and that question of what regulates in a society, not in an individual, but in a society, what regulates the free flow of in and out is somehow not functioning properly. And therefore the plague of Shrin, of boils comes for that reason. And I wanna learn this from a very, very uh, sweet story in the in the Babylonian Talmud on Sanhedrin uh, uh, tractate Sanhedrin Tzadik Chet Amud Aleph ninety. So I'm sure everybody's going to say like, oh yeah, I understand what Leon Wienerdow is doing there. He's studying the ten plagues from the Bible and using the Gemara to help. Yes, we we are familiar with that way of understanding our biblical texts, but. By contrast, we also have other ways of understanding our text that we've been able to compile here. So for example, we here brought Teklit Michael, who is an Eritrean refugee to Israel. And we asked him to study the 10 plagues, not from the perspective of another text, but from his own life experiences. What, what from your life experience of being an Eritrean refugee in Israel helps you understand the biblical 10 plagues from your own personal experience? Sometimes people think it's a punishment to Pharaoh or to Egyptians. I don't see the connection between punishment and the warning. Uh, because most of the time I don't see God as a punisher. I see God as just and um, as a being, higher being that protects the weaker. So most of the time, I don't see it as a punishment to Egyptians. I see it as a warning to those who are using their power to oppress others. So this is fascinating. This is an incredible video for everyone to watch, understanding how someone who has actually been through this kind of oppression might understand the plagues differently from those of us who are just trying to understand it through text and through our own intellectual capacity. So that's a very different type of interpretive possibility there. And it's a really worthwhile video to watch. And finally, uh, we couldn't have have done this project during the coronavirus without engaging directly with the plague that we were all facing. And so for example, we compiled a video from Tamara Tweel who gave birth during the coronavirus pandemic. And this is a different type of video that says plagues are still happening to us. It's not just a story from the Bible, but we're actually all living through a plague right now. And we're having life experiences during this time of pandemic. And we, we, couldn't possibly have put together this project without acknowledging that this was happening to all of us in real time. On March 29th, at the height of the COVID-19 outbreak in New York City, my son's gentle cry cut into a room, into a hospital, into a city overcome by fear and grief. When I try to make sense of that moment, I fixate on the sounds the tears of nurses as they struggled with securing protective equipment, the snaps of masks on and off, the Purell pumps, the feet shuffling to stay distant, and always, always the sirens, transporting the ill from home to hospital and the bodies from hospital to earth. So that's an incredible video to watch as well. So that's my quick little tour of the Plagues Project. And I hope what you um, can already tell is that we have compiled a collection of videos that deals with plagues over time and from a variety of perspectives. And so if you are thinking about Torah in time of plague, this might be a helpful way of contextualizing, expanding, 
wrestling with this story and the ways that it has affected us and those around us in our history and now. So to go a little deeper, I want to pass the floor to my colleague and friend Shira, who's going to help us understand a little bit more about how these videos work and what we're trying to do. Amazing. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that overview reflection and sort of the point of entry for everyone. Um, I think, you know, one of the hardest things when engaging with a project like this on a personal level as a contributor is really trying to pin down what is the point of entry, what is the angle that I want to take, particularly when our disciplines cross paths with other passions, personal passions in life. And I think, you know, part of this project was cultivating, curating very particular voices, but then speaking with each one of the individuals who presented, who contributed to really drill down and hone in on that point, um, that point of entry, which is not always an easy process when you have a lot of different interests. So I wanted to just share for just a few minutes, a few reflections on the particular angle that I took, and I struggled with what angle to take. So I kind of did a compendium of a lot of different angles. Um, the particular angle that I took in the Plagues Project, engaging with the moments that we were in, are in, will be in, from a place that felt very natural to me um, as a human. And what inspired me from my place of teaching, from my place of, of parenting, of work, of community building, and also from a place of the creative inclinations of my identity, just sort of who I am as a creative being, of, of amateur photographer artist in some ways and I, I really felt that the moment that we are in is one that's prompted me to think a lot about creativity and um, on a number of levels now my video is you're all invited to watch the full video and the, and the discussion there I just wanted to offer a brief window and sort of synopsis in that um, in today I'm going to share my screen again for just a moment so you can follow along with me um, okay, hang on one sec. Let me just move, put it on a full display for everyone. Um, I've really personally felt a creative surge during the months of pandemic. And I, I've watched alongside friends and colleagues who have in many ways been able to produce really remarkable creative works of arts and ideas. And it prompted me to really think on, at this moment and wonder whether this global plague can give rise to creativity on a much broader scale. And I open with, you know, a sense of disruption in the moment that we're in. And I, you know, I appreciated an article and interview that I read with, um, with novelist, comedian in many ways, Edgar Carrot, the Israeli novelist, who, who is in a Haaretz article reflecting on the moment and sort of his own kind of contributions in the moment said, life typically consists of a series of actions dictated by compulsive behavior that pushes us to do the same thing over and over. And coronavirus has broken this force of inertia. It's like a big slap in the face. Suddenly we see more, things we didn't see before. Um, and Carrot's point is that disruption itself, as painful as that disruption might be and as traumatic as it might be also provokes us to look at things quite differently and suddenly the things that are familiar our routines our regularities are all gone and we have actually no choice but to look at the world afresh and that's hard and that's challenging and when you're trying to manage your life and your profession and your family and illness of the ones that are close to you and um, it's difficult but it's almost leaving us with, with no option. Um, and as Kara, again, continues in the article, he's, he quotes his father, his father, um, a survivor who said, my father used to say that even if obviously he preferred the easy times, we learn the most about ourselves in difficult times. And in hindsight, those times are the ones that are the most interesting. And so all of these thoughts, not just at our Carrot's interview, but so many different reflections with friends, with colleagues, with philosophers, with theoreticians, with educators, with architects and schools who are just trying to figure out the moment in real time led me to think about ways of anchoring the moment, again, looking for precedents in Jewish texts and history for connection between plague and specifically the concept and the theme of creativity. Um, and one overarching question 
is really how can we impose or perceive order within the chaos? We all feel and continue to feel felt, will feel, right? A sense of chaos, missing our schedules, our routines, our structures, everything, the balances are sort of disturbed and upset. And how can, do we anchor ourselves and how have people been able to anchor themselves in the past? And for me, the project um, and for this project, it was really important to anchor it specifically in a biblical text um, with the biblical story of the Makot and different treatment of the Makot and specifically a question of how many were there, right? How many plagues were there in Egypt? Um, which is a bit of a more difficult question than it seems since different writers answered it in different ways. And I wanted to just offer one perspective from the point of view of what we would say the artist, right? The psalmist in Tehillim Kofay, Psalm 105, where the poet says, and for a time, I'm not going to read the parak together. Um, I'm happy to offer this uh, presentation afterwards. I'll put the link in the, in the chat. It's also online um, on the Plagues Project. But what we see in this parak of Tehillim, right, God said, you know, the poet says, the psalmist says, right, God performed signs among them, wonders against the land of Ham in Egypt, referring to the plagues. And we have a parak here from the point of view of the psalmist, of the poet, of the makot in Egypt. And the list that we get here is a list that's actually tumultuous. It's very chaotic. Um, there are seven or eight plagues. We're not entirely sure. It's a messy one. It's unstructured. You might say, you know, it's agitated. And that, I assume from the point of view of this parak, is the point, right? Living through a cataclysm of such biblical proportions doesn't allow one to reflect in an ordered way, right? And the poet here conveys that through this hurried and very wrathful list of catastrophes. We see a similar motif in Tehillim Ayin Chat, Psalm 78, again a reflection on, kind of a post-reflection on the time of the Makot of the plagues in this unstructured, messy, chaotic, creative way. Um, but a very, very different point emerges when we look at the Makot, when we look at the plagues in Egypt, a very different picture emerges from this description in Shemot in Exodus. Again, we're not going to look at the text together right now. You're invited to watch the video and kind of follow along there. But a key point when we look at the Makot, looking at the structures vis-a-vis -vis one another, is that in Shemot, the number of plagues is 10. Um, but more importantly, the structure is clearly delineated, it's tight, it's crafted, it's crisp, it's crisply conveyed. Each plague comes in turn, each has a beginning, each has an end. And the question is really like, do plagues really work this way, right? And the answer is, of course not, right? We, we don't have that sense of structure, but when we can reflect on them, often we're able to put them in context. And there are also larger structural issues in the narrative of the Makot as well. Some see a pattern of three plagues, then another three, then another three. So the division above, we could say three, 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 one, um, and this sort of single climactic plague. Nechama Leibowitz and other commentators point out that within each of the triplets, the first two Makot come with warnings, the third does not. In each set, the first two target specific places, one and two target the Nile, five, uh, four and five target the land, seven and eight come from the sky. There's also a pattern, again, different opportunities to reflect on the patterns here. There's also a pattern of seven and three. Um, this is true literarily and also Dr. Yoni Grossman argues ideologically, while the first seven plagues, the goal of the first seven Makot is to prove to the Mitzrayim that the God of Israel is the most powerful, the final three are meant to educate B'nai Israel, to give them something to talk about. And, and the point here is, you know, for us in this moment, is, um, is just the fact that actually there is clear and deliberate structure in the Torah. And out of the chaos, we can construct a narrative with beginning, middle, end, with themes, with lessons, with arguments that emerge in this very, very considered tight presentation. But that's not what it's like to live through a plague. But it may be how we can process that kind of experience, which is what we're doing right now. We're processing, we're able to create a table of contents in a book that has 
right? A processing coming from different points of view, different angles, different elements, and ordered thinking. And, and, and that is actually what we see in many ways in the Torah. And it leads to lots of different questions um, of uncertainty, of um, unmoredness from routines. We're surrounded by uncertainty. The moments were ones of surrounded by uncertainty, which allows in many ways the mind to wander. It opens up new vistas, new ways of thinking, processing, both small scale, large scale. And so throughout this, I thought to engage with that moment um, and that question of creativity on an individual level, on a global level. Um, I'll skip through here. Here's just some people that I included in the video whose voices, contemporary voices, I thought were interesting, reflecting on the moment, sort of juxtaposing questions of creativity and plague throughout both world history, Jewish history, stages of artistic development, um, as manifest in texts, in liturgy, and engaging with the very, very present moments of creative minds that I seek to kind of mine in this moment. And, and all of these things, and I'm going to skip through just the uncertainty piece, but all of these themes left me wondering, um, and a number of different plagues, uh, planes, sorry, and prompted me to ask what are all the different creative outputs of the plague of 2020 that historians in the future will write about? And I just want to run through a series of questions for us to ponder. I think some of them will be dealt with today. Here's just a selection. There are, of course, many, many more questions for us to think about. But just to sort of frame one of my signature pedagogies is just putting questions out that should be hovering over our thinking and learning over the course of the day. So I'm going to share that with you now. Some of these questions will read others. Again, I'll share the PowerPoint with you. Um, how have creative shifts in ritual and synagogue life enhanced or detracted from our sense of community? What will remain with us in a post-pandemic era? In what ways have organizations and not-for-profits been forced to reckon with their structures? What creative adaptations have enabled some to thrive while others have fared less well? How have halachic and legal realities been stretched and tested in our moments of creative need and adaptation? How elastic can our halachic system be? What are the fault lines? How have schools adapted to the moment we're in? What have new structural models, both physical and curricular, taught us about our students, the way they learn, the things that they need? What dimensions of creative experimentation and online education and Zoom life are most engaging? How have new seemingly limitless geographical possibilities shifted our sense of mission and goals in this arena? How have our homes as places of Jewish education, family life, and work been transformed? Strapped for space, have we been offered new insights into the nooks, corners, and crevices that may have gone unnoticed? Um, question, and I'm looking at the time, I'll skip, but question about the blurring of lines, um, what projects, works of art, short stories, musical scores, prayers, recipes, films, photographs have emerged from this era that would otherwise not have Again, resource question. And finally, what can our classical sources, historical experiences, texts, lived traditions, and adaptations offer us at this moment of plague, chaos, and, and uncertainty? There are many, many more questions, of course, that will be asked, that can be asked, that will continue to be asked. Um, for now, I leave you with these in the hopes of continuing the conversation, engaging in the creative learning together as a community, answering some of them maybe over the course of the day, in the coming months, um, and, and year ahead as we think about the creative moment that we've been thrust into against our sensibilities, against our knowledge, against our will, but really can emerge from as different mode with different excuse me with different modes um, of thinking living both in our personal lives our communal lives and our religious lives so thank you and i'm going to pass over um, to down to, to step back a little bit and talk about some of the larger creative structures that we've been working with where this project sits as housed within a larger context so thank you everyone yeah thanks thanks shira um so yeah, I want to build on what Shira and also Zoe were saying about uh, about and and the title of this panel is a cultural response to the plagues. Like I think that what we are doing should be understood itself not only as an examination of plagues, but as as a new approach to Jewish culture, to Jewish learning that in some sense could only have been possible thanks to the plague, um, which is a weird way to say it, thanks to the plague. But I think that there's something 
there. And um, I, I think about the actual, the story of the 10th plague and you sort of imagine the people, you know, what, what was happening that night? The people were told that this scary, you know, death was coming. And um, I, by the way, I have to share this. My, my sister at the Seder, at the Zoom Seder uh, said, she's a doctor. And she said, you know, there must have been anti-lammers back then. You know, and those were the people that thought that the 10th plague was a hoax and they didn't believe that they should put the blood on their doorpost and that that was gonna do anything. And and they, and they so, you know, that's an interesting thing to think about, but what about the other people who, who were not the anti-lammers, who were the lammers? And they, and they are sitting, I imagine them sitting afraid in their home, just sitting there in fear alone all night, just with their own family, afraid, hopefully this is gonna work, but I don't know, maybe it, it won't. And they're just alone. And I feel like the miracle of this plague is that in many ways, we have not been alone. We, we've been alone in our homes physically, but we've been able to connect with other people through the internet in a way that, um, you know, is not always completely satisfying, but is also quite powerful in many cases. And a conference like this probably wouldn't be able to happen a year ago. Uh, even if people had the idea, people would have said, oh, nobody's gonna come. Uh, it's a Zoom and nobody wants to do that. And my wife was actually just asking me this morning, like, do I think that this online stuff is going to continue after, after COVID? And I said to her, like, less, uh, but it will. And, and certain people will, will continue with it and certain ones won't and it'll slow down. But the people that do continue with it will have steady growth of that over time, the technology will change and it will become more and more satisfying. And the people that stick with it, I believe, will be at the center of Jewish life in you know, 50 years from now. And so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're building and to show it, but also to sort of think about where it could go if you imagine some of the uh, technology changes. And one thing that I wanna say, because I also think that the book, Torah in the Time of Plague, is, is, a, is a cultural response to plague itself and should be seen that way. And it's wonderful and it's critically important. And we should also understand the differences between ex, of accessibility between a book, a text heavy, you know, a text base, based approach like Safaria or 929, much of it. And what we're doing here with the Plagues Project, which is largely about video. And frankly, as somebody who does most of my work as a podcaster, I actually think that audio for people, except for people with uh, hearing disabilities, audio is even more accessible than video because you can do it while you're running or while you're doing something else. And so in a sense, like I almost feel like we're not quite there even yet with the Plagues Project because we need to ultimately turn that into like podcasts to make it fully accessible. But I think that what we're trying to do here is to say there are two kinds of accessibility that we're talking about. One is accessibility to the good stuff, the deepest Jewish ideas by people who are not immersed in that kind of lifestyle. And the Jewish community, in my opinion, wrongly, imagines that those people are not interested in the deep Jewish substance stuff. It's not that they're not interested, it's that they're not, they're not yet so interested that they're willing to sit for hours and hours and hours reading a book that's hard for them to read, it's impenetrable, they don't have the context, right? But, but, they, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested in the really deep stuff. So if we can present that in media forms that are truly accessible to them, uh, that, that's very powerful. And a lot of people will be attracted to real Torah study if it can be presented in that fashion. And the other piece of accessibility, which is for the people who are already interested in Torah study, it's that, think about how often we all immerse ourselves, truly immerse ourselves in a perspective on Torah from a community other than our own. And, and, uh, and, and, if, and if we do in a, in, a, in a certain community, what about all the other communities that are out there? Jews of color, LGBT Jews, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. How often do we really sit and immerse ourselves and understand that face of Torah? You know, there's 70 faces of Torah. And, and I think that most of us don't do it that much. And so there's another that, and why don't we do it? I mean, I, we should all think to ourselves, but I think that part of it has to do with, it's a, it's a lot of, uh, 
it's a lot of commitment to, to find a, a book, to find out what to read and to really read it and get into it. And I think you too would understand that accessibility through video or audio would be much a much more inviting way to consider a Torah perspective uh, from some of another community. So that's what we're trying to build here. And I just wanna show very briefly the context of all this, which is um, a project, we've called it Text People. We've ended up with Text People as our organizing theme. And that comes from Abraham Joshua Heschel's quote that what we need more than anything else is not textbooks, but text people, which at the time that Heschel said it, he meant we need human beings who embody Torah, uh, not, not, you know, that, that that itself is powerful Torah. But I would say that today that also is, means the potential that we can teach Torah through a human voice more powerfully than through the, the printed page, which is a revolution in Judaism to the extent that we think of ourselves as the people of the book, but that's because video wasn't invented yet. So uh, we, so I should say, by the way, it's textpeople.org because the .com cost $7,395. So if anybody wants to uh, purchase that for us, we could, we could be .com, but right now we're textpeople.org. And if you go there, you can see these different projects there. And each one of them is similar to the walkthrough that Zoe gave you. Uh, and, and has different perspectives. And, and they have the same sort of major themes. So if you look at the McGill Project, it's the same major themes, but some of them have different kinds of perspectives. Like for example, the McGill Project is feminism heavy for obvious reasons. The Akedah Project has a lot of uh, LGBT uh, heaviness because of this idea of sacrificing a child or being called on to ask, sacrifice a child, including a very, very powerful video by uh, a mother of, a, of an, an Orthodox mother of an, of an Orthodox child who uh, came out as gay and was and she felt that she was being asked by her community to sacrifice him. And she said, no, it was very powerful. And I think probably our most viewed video of all of these videos. And um, so I, I, so that's kind of what we're building. And what I want you to imagine is right now, Text People has three themes. Imagine that it would have something like this for every, literally every major story and piece, not just stories, but every, every piece of Jewish text, Tanakh and beyond, that, that, that's significant. Imagine that we had something like that for every single one of them over time. It's like Safaria, but, but this way. And, um, and imagine that you could enter into it either by the, the text that you're wanting to look at. And by the way, my dream is to have 70 videos for each one. So there would be literally 70 faces of Torah, um, but that you would you would be able to go through any piece of, of text and explore it through all 70 faces, or you would be able to say, I really want to explore all of the Jewish literature through, for example, a feminist lens, and I am just going to click on feminist lens and it marches me through the entire textual tradition in chronological order through that perspective. So that's kind of the dream and, um, and, and the hope, and that's of course part of a much larger dream, which is to truly make uh, our tradition as, as fully accessible as possible through as many different uh, lenses as possible so that we can truly uh, have the entire Jewish people being able to connect to our tradition in, in powerful ways. Uh, so with that, I think we will leave it for some questions. We have uh, just a few minutes. If anybody has any questions they want to put in the chat, we can take them. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just say a thank you to, to Dan, to Shira, and to Zoe. Um, and I want to highlight what Dan said before, uh, which is that this, this panel focused as it is on a particular cultural response to COVID-19 is an attempt to highlight the many different ways that we might tap into the resources of our Jewish community during this time. And so the book, the website, um, they are just but examples of ways that we have um, entered into this conversation and ways that we have made space for others to do so as well. So that as so many people have said that it, we can be alone together um, and in so doing really celebrate that which the opportunities that this, that this plague has actually given us to mine our tradition and our own psyches to frankly uh, build a togetherness when we find ourselves so very alone. Um, so if there are any questions now, you can put it in the chat. We only have two minutes. Um, 
so I will just share while I wait that um, we'll conclude this session shortly um, and pick up again at 1030. <clears throat> At 10.30, we'll have the chance to hear from um, Dr. David Svi-Kalman, an extraordinary, extraordinary thinker, creator, um, eclectic collector, just really a, a fantastic, fantastic um, human being and writer in this book who will be speaking um, about acts of God, the tricky theology of natural disasters. Um, I highly, highly encourage you to come back. We will keep the Zoom room open for anybody who wants to stay on our, you can shut your video and you can stay between sessions or if not, just sign back in um, at 10.30. So I thank you all so very much. And I look forward to a wonderful day together exploring from all these different angles, um, plague and its possibilities. So thank you. We socialize or do it? Uh... You're allowed to socialize, but you could also just go talk to your wife in the next room. We're not in the same house. So you don't <laughs> know that because it's Zoom. <laughs> I could also talk to my parents in New Rochelle. Share Zoe and Dan, um, <clears throat> you're free to, to go if you want to, but there are some questions that are emerging in the chat that if you want to take up, uh, please do so. Uh, this question of how open is it to contribute, um, get in touch with us. We we um, uh, it's a it's a it's an active question that we've had over time. Is at, at what point is it? How would we make it more open where just people could contribute? That would require a level of uh, editorial work on our part that we just really haven't had the time to do. We, this is actually I should have said this is a very uh, low budget situation. Uh, we're we're seeking funding uh, so that we could do more. But at, at the time being, we didn't want to sort of fully open it up because then people would be submitting stuff to us all the time and we didn't really have the bandwidth to fully evaluate things and decide, but but we're certainly willing to, to chat with people. And then as we create new projects, um, we're certainly looking for, we'd love to know who's, who has things to say about things and who would be interested in doing something. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I'll also just offer um, in the spirit of maximum inclusivity also in, in, for the 99 project. Um, for that, we actually do have a little bit more bandwidth on an editorial uh, from an editorial perspective. So if there are the, if there are people who are interested in writing a short reflection, and I mean, obviously it has to be in line with cycle and we're up to Mishle, we'll be studying this summer. Eo, the Book of Job, Shira Shirim, the Megillot, there's a lot coming up. So I'm going to put my email in the chat if you're interested in engaging specifically with um, a piece of text from a point of view, then we can offer that. And then obviously we'll keep everyone up to date in terms of larger projects that emerge from this collaboration. Um, and before I sign off, because I have a call in, in just a few minutes, I did just want to say also that what was what's so wonderful about this collaboration in many ways is that Dan, Zoe, and I actually met sort of serendipitously at a conference, um, the Z3 Zionism conference at the JCC in Palo Alto. And it was a moment that we did not know each other, we were a little bit familiar with the, with the work of one another. And the the as we're building these digital platforms, I long in many ways for a return to that in-person kind of immersive experience because you actually never know what will come from those kinds of meetings and learning together. Um, and yet the beauty of being able to have so many different people and voices involved in this platform and meeting new faces can kind of propel other projects. So there is this tension that um, we're living with and I really just thank everyone for being here. I'm gonna put a couple of things in the chat and I'll be in and out um, over the course of the day, but thank you for everything and call a kavod to the whole team. Erin, so exciting to celebrate together with you. Thank you. See everybody at 1030.